Biology and the molecular biosciences is a discipline of nuance and subtlety. Our breakthrough discoveries are not dramatic in the moment. A slightly darker color change, a small band appearing, or a reading that is slightly lower or higher than we expected. This reflects the complexity of organisms and how tightly constructed every part of our biology is. Even a 5-10% to shift in gene expression can mean the difference between normal cell growth and cancer. A 5% difference might also mean nothing. It could just be the statistical margin of error. The thin line that separates genuine breakthrough from random background noise only exists if we can control as many experimental conditions as possible. If it's your first time here, I'm Jack Wayne. On this channel, we talk about science education and all the transferable skills you can learn and apply towards different career paths. Today, we're talking about designing experiments by controlling the controllables. In the last video, we talked about learning hands-on skills for the first time and how observing, copying, and repeating the techniques can help you learn using the lab mimic method. Designing experiments though needs more than hands-on competency. You also need cognitive competency to think about and plan your experiments. Ideally, you want a baseline for comparison an experimental trial where nothing is being added or changed. You don't expect to see any changes or effects at all, and this is a control experiment, more specifically a negative control. Then when you do the real experiment, say by adding a drug, the effect is compared against your negative control to see if it's real. You can also set up positive control experiments where you change a condition known to affect the process, say by adding a very famous well-studied drug. An important analytical skill is to look at any experiment and identify what are good positive and negative controls for the experiment you're designing. This is all rather abstract, so let's talk through five examples using different experimental techniques. Starting with culture-based testing for identifying pathogens. A biochemical test that shows bubbles, color changes, or agglutination if a specific pathogen is present within the patient's sample. What if every patient sample shows bubbles? At what point do you become suspicious if every test is coming back positive with color changes or agglutination? We need a negative control. A patient sample that doesn't contain any pathogen or contains a different pathogen than the one that is being tested for. Only if the negative control tests negative can you trust a positive result. What about a positive control? You can have a pure culture of that specific pathogen and run it through the test. The test should pick it up and show a positive result. If the test cannot identify the purified form of the pathogen, it won't be sensitive enough to pick up trace amounts present in a patient's sample. Let's talk about antibiotic sensitivity testing. To check if a new superbug is resistant to antibiotics, we can add a whole array of different antibiotics to it using the disk diffusion method. What would be a good negative control? You can either set up a whole new plate of the same bacteria growing in the absence of any antibiotics, or simply look at part of the agar plate without any discs in close proximity. There should be bacterial growth on these areas. Another approach would be to add an antibiotic that you know won't work on this bacteria. What about positive controls? It would be an antibody that you know will kill the bacteria definitely. And if you have both positive and negative controls in place, you can actually assess if any of the results are valid. Next, let's talk about a DNA transformation where we are trying to express a new gene inside bacterial cells. What will the controls be? It could be bacterial cells that went through each part of the transformation, just like the real experiment, but no DNA was added. Only bacteria expressing the new gene will be able to survive on these plates, so a negative control should not have any bacterial cells surviving. In fact, if there are colonies on your negative control plate, you actually can't trust all the colonies on your actual experimental plate. Positive controls aren't that common in transformations, but maybe you can think of one to set up. How about a PCR? We have primers designed to amplify a specific section of DNA, and if the PCR works, we will see a band appear when we run the reaction on a DNA gel. A band appearing doesn't mean much though. It can be a random bit of DNA or a contaminant. We can set up a reaction using exactly the same reagents, the same master mix, except no genomic DNA is added in the negative control. There's no template DNA for the primers to bind to, so we shouldn't see any bands appear unless they are contaminants. There isn't really a great positive control you can use in a PCR. You're using a different set of primers that you know will definitely amplify something, but that's not great because the biggest variable in a PCR are the primers you're using. On top of the controls, we can also check the size of any bands against the DNA ladder, a reference set of bands to make sure it matches the gene size that we want to amplify. Our last example, tissue culture. If we're adding a new drug that is supposed to promote cell growth, we can add the drug to cells and monitor its growth every day. Cells will normally grow anyway, so the negative control will be the same cells as the real experiment in a different flask without any of the drug added. Only by controlling the controllables can scientists separate signal from the noise and define genuine experimental discoveries. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and we'll talk more about experimental design in the next video.